I'm not taking responsibility for this. <laughs> he must be confusing me with a responsible adult. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my wife. Um, okay, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Like I say, if we don't get started, we'll never finish. This is a, a sad passage because Paul is on his way out. He's in the Mamertine prison. He pretty much knows this is the last round for him, and he's talking to his protege, Timothy he calls him his son in the faith. And with his son in the faith, and he knows he's going to be gone, he's trying to cram a lot into a small space here. And then this last, this chapter here is kind of sad because it says, in the end times, bad things are going to happen. And if I, when I read through this list, I was like, wow, this looks like something that just happened on the news, you know, last night. When you look at the attitudes of people in this world, what does everybody say universally? Whether you're left or right or Democrat, Republican, whether you're tuned out or tuned in, people say the world's become uncivil. People are about themselves. They're harsh. They're mean. They're angry. They're so if you just read right here, it says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and they'll love their money. They will be boastful. They will be proud. They will scoff at God. They will be disobedient to their parents. They will be ungrateful. They will be considered, they will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving. They will be unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride. And they will love pleasure more than they love God. They will love pleasure rather than God. Now, like I said, this just reads like right out of the paper. This is the general attitude of society around us. And what he says is, don't you know that in the last days, this is going to be how people act. We are in the last days, people. And I'm not setting a date. I'm just saying this is the attitude. This is the... the the format by which the end times come. Because if you look at society, this is picture perfect. Now, obviously when I say there's end times or in the last days, sometimes people go, well, I don't think we are. I don't think that's true. Well, Paul thought that, that he was. Well, if Paul thought he was, that was like thousands of years ago, right? Well, you know who else thought? Moody thought he was in the last days. John Calvin thought he was in the last days. Um, everyone that studies scripture and that looks at it accurately thinks they're in the end days. And that's because there's a thing in the Bible called the imminent return of Christ. And that's that at any moment, the Lord could come back. So how are you living? Are you living like the Lord's coming back? Or are you living like, in, in the Bible it says there was an unfaithful servant who said, the Lord delays his return. He's not coming back, so I can live any way I please. If that's your attitude, that's the wicked servant. The attitude of the Apostle Paul and all the greats throughout the years has been, it could be today. What are you out if you live your life like, to, like this could be your last day? If you lived your life like this was your last week on earth, you would live without any regrets, wouldn't you? You'd reconcile with the people that you should reconcile with. You'd talk with the people that you haven't talked with. You would live your life with a priority of the eternity. And we're supposed to live our life in light of eternity. So there's nothing wrong with looking at the, the Bible and looking at the time around us and going, time is short. Time is really short. Like I said, you don't have to be left, right, tuned in, tuned out. It doesn't matter. This is a description of our society. The last verse says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. That's a harsh thing, isn't it? That they're, they have this form of godliness, the King James says, but deny the power thereof. In other words, they keep on going on like we all want to be religious and live in this little, 
this little fort, us four no more, we're right, you're wrong, but there's no power to change a life there. Christianity, true Christianity changes lives. It's about other people, it's about eternity, it's about love. And so Christianity moves out of, this, out of these walls and it moves out into the people that are our lives. That's truly what Christianity is. If you have this form of godliness and deny the power thereof, isn't that what you have to overcome when you witness to people and talk to people? You say, you know, I'd like to talk to you about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Boom. Wait a second. I know what you're talking about. My aunt told me I was going to hell because I have a tattoo. My uncle was an elder in the, in the whatever church, and um, he, he was dishonest in his business. Right? You have to overcome religion constantly because it is a form of godliness and denies the power thereof. We need to be people of power. When, when I prayed earlier, I prayed that the Holy Spirit would indwell us so that we had power. Power what? To be a radiant light in a society. The extra that we need to minister to others. As Christians, we shouldn't be just holding on. Oh, it's a tough Christian life. I'm just holding on. It should be exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ever ask or hope for. How can you do that in hard times? Because I, I can hear myself immediately going, wait a minute, people go through tough times. Sometimes you do just hold on. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's presence and God the Father in heaven give us the perspective that this is temporary. The Apostle Paul went through a lot of stuff. And he said, these present light afflictions are nothing compared to the glory that awaits me in heaven. Well, he had a vision of what was going to happen afterwards. If you have a vision of what's going to happen afterwards, it gives you hope to carry on and it gives you like a lightheartedness. That um, if you just look at the here and now, it can be very depressing, can it? It can be like really like, uh, this isn't getting any better. It's only getting worse. I've always thought that the people that were the most disturbed in this world were the people who actually had feelings and emotions and could see what was going on. You're like, um, I saw a bumper sticker once that says, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and I get the sentiment, but I'm not angry. I'm paying attention. But see, I put it all in perspective of going, God is in control, and I know how this story ends. This is, a, this is like, we're on, like on, we're on the Titanic. It's been hit all the way down the side. It's sinking. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Rearrange the deck chairs? <laughs> Pretend like it's not happening? Have a nice meal before the ship goes down? Or get people in the lifeboat? And that's what we're about, getting people in the lifeboat. Now, if you go around screaming at people, get in the lifeboat, and being all crazy, they might not go. They might think you're just crazy. So you do have to relate to people on a level that they're at. You know, if you just walk up to a stranger and go, Jesus is coming back, you've got to get saved, <laughs> you might end up locked up. So you might want to know them better before you say something like that to them. But that is the bottom line. The bottom line is that none of us last. We all fade away. We all need that personal relationship with Christ. We all need to be sharing that with other people because that's why we were born. That's why we were redeemed. So a form of godliness that denies the power of is like an abomination. It's like the opposite of Christianity. It looks like Christianity, but it's close. But it's not real. The devil's always a counterfeiter. And there's counterfeit Christianity. There's counterfeit religion. And then people call it religion. I'm not religious. I'm like, not me either. I can't stand religion. Religion, I think, is something that people either falsely hold up and they go like this. Yeah, I'm religious. I'm, I'll pick a religion. I'm Methodist. I was confirmed a Methodist. What about your relationship with Christ? I'm Methodist. I'm confirmed. Yeah, but what about you? I'm Methodist. I'm confirmed. Talk to my pastor about that. So it's like this false thing that you either grab a hold of, and I got my card signed off on. You know, I got confirmed. I got baptized. I'm a member. I'm good. So it's a false assurance, or else it's a, I hate religion. So you can hold it up either way. You can say a reason why you're not going to be close to God or a reason why I already am. So religion can fall into this category of being very dangerous, whereas relationship is what God is after. 
True relationship is what God is after. So the form of godliness is denying the power thereof is a, is a counterfeit kind of thing. And if I was making counterfeit money right now, if I made purple $13 bills with Mickey Mouse on them, I probably wouldn't even get arrested. You know why? Because people go, that's ridiculous. He's just being funny. They make counterfeit to look just like the real thing, but it doesn't have the backing behind it. So true religion is the Bible. So we have scripture, it's about people, and it's about eternity. Now, people and eternity are important, but scripture keeps us playing within the boundaries. Because sometimes people go, eternity, people, let's use any method we can to get people to heaven. And then you see all these extra rules or less than Jesus, just be a good person. Or The Bible keeps us on track. The Bible doesn't move. This is the one thing that really, this is why I'm a Bible guy. This is why I like the Bible. This is why I'm stuck on the Bible. Why we're going to keep going through the Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Because I ran up against my lifestyle in the Bible. And I went, is that guy who's teaching right now, is he teaching, he's offending me. Is, it, is he offending me because of something he personally believes? Or is he offending me because he's teaching the Bible? So when I offend you, because I probably will, even today, um, if I offend you, you have to weigh it out. Is that Rich's take on it? Or is that what the Bible says? Because I can tell you this, my opinion means nothing. I'm just, a, I'm just a guy. But the Bible's not moving. The Bible has wore out anvil after anvil after anvil of assault against it. The Bible still stands. God's word is still true. So uh, the Apostle Paul was telling Timothy, stay on these things that I've taught you. Don't go for the counterfeit. Don't go for a form of godliness that denies the power of God. They're the kind, and this is the people who it says, it says stay away from people like that. Now, what this means is, it doesn't mean that if people don't agree with you, you don't ever talk to them. They're second-class citizens. What it means is you take a step back. Just go, you know, because if you stand right there, if someone's doing something very offensive or wrong, and you stand with them, you're supporting them. If you take a step back and just give yourself some distance and go, I'm not cool with that. That's not good. But if you want to restore someone, you can't totally break fellowship with them, can you? If you want to win them back over, then you have to constantly be in contact with them. So it, what it really, what this demands is wisdom. Because there's some people you've got to take two steps back from. <laughs> and there's some people you just have to warn and they go, oh, I'm sorry. So this isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, but it does say that when a person is in this state that you go, nope, I can't walk with you because we're not agreed. We're not on the same sheet of music. Get that, Tim? <laughs> same sheet of music. Okay. It says, they're the kind who, who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they never are able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Jannies and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Jannies and Jambres. And this is a story in the Old Testament. The magicians of Egypt were able to duplicate most of the miracles that Moses was doing to deliver the people. So he would make the water turn to blood, they would make the water turn to blood. Like they needed more of that. You know, <laughs> whatever the curses were, they'd make it happen too. At some point they went, this is supernatural, we can't keep up. But for a long time they just were able to, through tricks, make it look the same. And that's the thing, is sometimes people can, don't ever be fooled. The devil has power. And there's a, a form of godliness that has, like, if you say, okay, we're going to form a religion, no drinking, no smoking, 
we just have a bunch of rules. Don't do this, and then we have a bunch of rules. Do this. Those kind of clubs actually work. They'll help you straighten your life out. But what will they do for your soul? Many reform programs over the years have taken alcoholics off the street, you know, cleaned them up, put a suit on them, you know, shave that beard off, you know, get a, get a haircut, get a real job. And they, it works, but it doesn't reach the problem. So those guys always relapse. They always go back. And let's say they, let's say they had such a good program that they never relapsed. What would you have in the end? A really clean cut looking guy who paid his bills who went to hell. You know, so it doesn't reach the soul. You have to reach the soul. So just because a program works or a church has a certain amount of power or they're showing a certain amount of results, that doesn't mean that God's in it. Now, I don't want to pretend like for a second here that we have the corner on the market here. The gospel is one thing. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the number one guy there. I'm the sinner. I'm the big sinner. If we all walked around saying that, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the, I'm the number one guy, or the number one gal. I'm a sinner. I needed to be saved. That humble message reaches and resonates with the world. One was like, yeah, but you need to do this and this and this and that, and that does not reach the world. Because Christianity is not a program. Christianity is a relationship with God. It's passed from person to person. It's not a program. It's a relationship. It can be imitated, but the real thing is a changed life. And that's something that you can tell in a person. Do they have peace? Do they have joy? Are they full of the Lord? Are they full of his spirit? But you, Timothy, certainly know, know I teach and how, how I teach and how I live and what my purpose is in life. So Paul's saying, you know what I say, you know what I do. And you know what my goals are. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. Faith, patience, love, and endurance is faith, hope, and love. Christianity is more than being kind, but it's not less than kind. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes people will get so bent on their religion or their being right or whatever, it is. It's, Christianity about truth, it sure is. It's more than truth, but it can't leave truth. So this idea of faith, hope, and love, these ingredients must be there, because they endure everything. Faith, hope, and love, they're eternal. The greatest of these is love. So you can't be less than loving. Paul saying, you know how I lived, you know what I taught, you know what my purpose was, and you know my faith, hope, and my love. My, my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I've endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from it all. Yes, and everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There's a promise for you. That's not one you usually see on the wall. I want to see when somebody put that one a needlepoint on the wall. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. My promise for today. <laughs> and I'm joking, but I'm telling you the truth. If you don't tell people that, you're doing them a great disservice. It's like telling your kids when they're, when they're growing up. If you do everything right, no one will ever hurt your feelings. If you do everything right, no one will ever break your heart. If you do everything right, you'll never be judged wrong. If you do everything right in life, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Now, I think a kid that was grown, you know, if you taught that, your kid that the whole time growing up, at some point they would look at you and say, I'm not listening to you anymore because you lied to me. But many times that's how Christianity is pitched. If you live your life the Christian way, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And I'm sorry, but a lot of bad things happen to a lot of good Christians. Jesus Christ died on the cross, spit on, slaughtered. What did he do wrong? Did he, did he make a wrong turn and end up in, at Calvary? Did he tick off the wrong people? No, that was God's plan for him before, he, before eternity. 
He stepped out of eternity to do that. He was living right. He lived perfect. And look what happened to him. Same way with the disciples and the apostles. You can be living a perfectly good life, and troubles will come your way. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Factor it in. That way when it happens, you're like, here's my persecution. What's it for? What's this going to produce? Because when you as a Christian are stretched out like this, getting tortured, for no good reason except for the gospel, you can look around and say, who's God going to save? What's God going to do? What's he doing in me? What's he doing in the world around me? God's working because I'm stretched out. God's working because I'm suffering. I'm going to talk about the suffering you bring on yourself. Like sometimes I'm walking too fast in the parking lot and I fall down and slam into the ground. I go, oh, I'm suffering for the cause of Christ. No, I'm not. <laughs> suffering because I'm top heavy and my shoes were too slippery. <laughs> and I was moving too fast. There's a difference between suffering for foolishness or just natural cause of life and suffering for the cause of Christ. When you suffer for the cause of Christ, though, and you feel like you're being unjustly condemned, you can go, what's God doing here? I mean, it might come out like this. What are you doing? But it might end up being like, what are you doing? Because I sometimes will say things to God and I'm like, wait a second. That's not the respect I'm supposed to give God. I better change my tone a little bit. I don't feel so bad about it, because if I look in the Psalms, sometimes David cries out, God, why? And then he, as he progresses, because God goes, you're talking to the right person now. When you have a problem in this whole wide world, take it to God. He's in charge. Every bad thing that's ever happened to you, God could have stopped. Do you know that? He's got lightning bolts. He can stop anything from happening, but he doesn't. So if you have a problem, God, why didn't you stop that? Why didn't you? Because you're going to get to that spot anyways. You might as well start at the top. If you have to do it in despair, do it in despair. You'll come to respect as you get into his presence. I'm not saying be flippant with God. I'm saying be real with God. Just like David the psalmist was. He was a man after God's own heart. And if you read the Psalms, he would bring his passion to God. It's a lot better to vent to God than it is to go around and say to other people, your kids, your, your spouse, other people, I don't know what God's doing here. It's like, whoa, oh, really? So you're throwing God under the bus. And then later on, you're going to tell those people that God is the answer to everything, right? Later on, you're going to want them to follow Jesus. But now you're throwing them under the bus. It's better to go, I can't talk to anyone right now. And then you go, God, what are you doing? Seriously, God, what's going on? God, please help me. God, please clue me in. God, please. And you know what God does? He answers. He gives you peace, and he gives you joy, and he gives you long-suffering. Because he wants you to succeed. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to be a witness to the people around you. He's not setting you up for failure. He's setting you up for success. But a lot of times we're like, oh, God's forsaken me on Facebook. <laughs> wow, thanks for advertising. <laughs> Guess I'll have to overcome that one. <laughs> no, we all have bad days and we've all misrepresented God. That's true. But don't give yourself an excuse to keep misrepresenting God. Blame it on God and take it up with him. Blame it on God and take it up with him. He controls everything. It makes you close to him. It keeps your accounts close. And I've learned, I've learned over time of doing this that when I'm like, boy, I'm really... <clears throat> What's God doing? What's God doing? I used, to, I used to marvel at old saints. Old saints in the faith. And no matter what, how messed up things were, no matter how bad the thing, they'd be like, just like, like Clint Eastwood, you know, like that high plains drifter thing where it looks like it's just chiseled into his features to be like they go God's on a throne that smile that, that's like stony smile through tough times God's on the throne I'd be like where do they get that from they get it for years of battering years of tough times and realizing that God always comes through God's always got a purpose these tents they get racked 
They get, they get wrecked, these, these temporary tents we're in. But this is not eternity, and this is not the end. Tragedies aren't the end. So, it says, you know what I've suffered. Yes, everyone who wants to live godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish, and they will deceive others, and they themselves will be deceived. But you must remain faithful. You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. When tough times come, you will resort to your training. I learned that in the Army. Whatever they trained you to do, when times get tough, you'll go back to that. My wife's taught me that in playing the cello. When she plays the cello, like when you get rattled, when you get nervous, then things kind of fall apart, but you'll fall back to your training. You have to be taught, and you have to teach yourself that God is good, that he's in control, and that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You have to go back to your fallback position. You have to go, when I'm upset and I'm angry, and I, I won't speak to other people right now, I'll say I'm upset and I'm angry, I'm not good at speaking right now, and you'll take it up with God. And let God give you the words to overcome these things. Like, God, what's best for the kingdom of God? That, that is one of my stress. Like, when I'm under stress and I have to make decisions, I'm like, what's best for the kingdom of God? What's best for the kingdom of God? What's best for the kingdom of God? Because that's eternity. Eternity, eternity, eternity. It's not about me. It's not about now. It's not about here or what's easy. It's about what's best for eternity. It stops my tongue, stops me from making bad decisions. So it says, you must be, remain faithful to the things that you've been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses, us, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. This will be our closing passage. I'm not teaching for. I lied. I apologize. No, it says that you've been taught that the Holy Scriptures are good from the childhood. All Scripture is inspired by God. It is useful to teach what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. This is the way that we judge whether things are right or wrong. This is the the screen, the funnel, the, the matrix by which we go, is something right or wrong? Is this true or false? You can't run your intellect. I mean, you have to run your intellect through the Bible, not the other way around. Sometimes we run the Bible through our intellect. We go, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't believe that because it doesn't make sense to me. There are many things in the Bible that I read through and I go, I don't know. I don't understand. I mean, I'm a Bible teacher. You can say, hey, uh, Rich, what do you think about this? A good answer you might get from me is, I don't know. And, and if you don't know something in the Bible, it's all right to look at someone and say, I don't know. Let's look at it together. You, you, you study it for a week. I'll study it for a week. We'll talk about it next week. There's a lot of things I go, I don't understand that, and they put it on the back burner. I don't say I don't believe it. I just put it on the back burner and go, I don't get that. I don't understand and many times, God has later on shown me exactly what that means. Over time, as I read other passages and put the puzzle together. Like, I don't, I don't see how this works, and this works, and this works. Most of the things I don't understand about God has made God bigger and made me smaller. And I've realized there's a lot of things I'm just never going to understand. Someone asked me about God's sovereignty, him knowing everything, from start to finish, and us still having a free choice. 
and I went, <laughs> yeah. Those aren't, those aren't congruent. They don't come together. If he knows everything and he's sovereign, then we don't have a free choice, do we? That's what some people think. But my Bible tells me I do have a free choice. So if I have a free choice, then God doesn't know which way I'll choose. Yes, he does. Well, how do you put those two together? I don't. Those two facts I put out there as facts. And I don't understand how they work, but God does. God is sovereign. He knows the beginning from the end. I have free choice. It's all through his word. I won't teach one to the exclusion of the other. And I won't want to hold up this one to the exclusion of the other. I'll teach them both just as strong as I can and then make you realize God's bigger than your brain. God's bigger than your brain. Did you know that? If I tried to explain God perfectly to you, it'd be like, um, I have a really smart dog at home. Her name's Fiesta. She's half Mexican hairless and half border collie. I call her a south of the border collie. <laughs> and she's really smart. But if I took a globe and I went, hey, Fiesta, come here. I'm going to tell you where we're at on the globe. Let me explain this. You're not paying attention. Let me get a treat. She doesn't speak the language, does she? She doesn't understand globe. She doesn't understand location. She doesn't understand anything but treats and affection. Sometimes when I ask God, God, I just don't know why. I think God's like, I can't explain it to you. It's beyond your capacity. You're not, you're not big enough. You're not smart enough yet. Someday you will know as you are known. How well does God know me? Very, very, very well. Someday I will know as I am known. We won't. And I'm going to tell you something. I'll give you a little clue here. We're not going to get into heaven and have this line. We're really, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. <laughs> have you ever said that or thought that? No, you're going to get to heaven and go, I had a, whoa. <laughs> oh, I get it now. <laughs> you're God. <laughs> this was a lot bigger than I thought. Things were, everything was connected. Wow. That was connected to that was connected to that. You mean that made this happen over here? Oh, I get it. We'll stand in awe. We'll just be like, Holy and righteous are your ways. Your judgments are true. I didn't get it then. I thought it was unfair then. I thought it was wrong. I thought it was, I get it. I understand. So as, as Timothy is, is closing this thing out with, I mean, as, as Paul is closing this thing out with Timothy, he's going, hey, it's about people. You bet it's about people. And you bet it's about eternity. But the only way that we know how to operate with eternity and people is this book. This is the rule book. This keeps us in line. It keeps us from going too far. It keeps us from lagging back. So as we go through the word, it's revealed to us what's important and what's not. What we can drop and what we have to stick to. Because those are judgment calls I can't make. This isn't the, the church of rich. It's a church based on the Bible based on relationship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit giving us the power to do what God has asked us to do. So let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. You make it very plain, and you make it very clear. In the world around us, it gets foggy. In the world around us, it gets cloudy. Our minds are cloudy, and our understanding is very small at times. But I pray that as we come into your presence with our brothers and sisters, that you make it clear. You make it clear and plain that it's about people and it's about eternity. And I pray as we read your word that you would reveal to us on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, just what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to function in this organism called the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>